Good morning, everyone. OK. Yeah, so still coffee, right? Yeah. So today we are going to talk about enterprise data governance and compliance at scale. So I'm Sri Subaya, a Senior Engineering Manager in Data Platform Team in Tulio. And I have with me uh, Sunil Patel, who is a Senior Software Engineer in Data Platform. And also I have Chi Chi. Can you raise your hand? Uh, he, uh, Chi Chi is a Senior Software Engineer in Data Platform. So Sunil and Chi Chi has been one of the core contributors of our uh, compliance and governance framework in Data Platform. OK, Tulio. How many of you here know Tulio apps or Tulio APIs? OK, good number. So for those of you who don't know Tulio or who have not used actually Tulio, um, knowingly or unknowingly, you are already using Tulio if you are using apps like Uber, Remind, Airbnb, uh, Amazon SMS, or Salesforce, or Netflix. So Tulio Cloud Communication Platform provides programmable API for SMS, voice, video, chat, and a lot more. And Tulio's mission is to fuel the future of communication. And we have around 46,000 plus customers. And if you see the scale of our data, it's 1 billion voice or message data points per day. And we are developer first community. Basically, we have around 1.9 million developers developing in our platform. And our existence is around 100 plus countries. And think of the compliance requirements on all those 100 plus countries on various compliance requirements. So given that, we have various products, around 30 plus products across, for example, voice, video, authy, chat, uh, intelligence, et cetera, and et cetera. So there is a strong amount and massive amount of data flowing across Tulio between various teams. And there is a need for a shared services or some centralized management of data. And there comes the data platform. You can see this picture. Basically, it's a 10,000 foot view of our data platform. And you can see various layers over here. So primarily, for example, ingestion layer, pipeline layer, data storage, data processing, and data usage. The ingestion layer, primarily, we have three channels. One is a Kinesis, Kafka, and also the bulk, which is basically bulk load from many databases. And once we ingest the data, we have various storage mechanism as well. Our data lake is one of the primary storage mechanism. But apart from that, we have Dynamo, MySQL, Elastic, Kudu, and Cassandra. To process this data across various uh, data sources and data storage systems, we use Spark primarily. And from data usage perspective, once the data is processed, it has been used in analytics and for data science, and also many other teams directly use that as well. So this is a very simplified version, and today we will be focusing primarily on the pipeline and data storage, basically the data lake, and data processing Spark. As you can see the various layers, what's the scale at which we handle the data? We have, as I mentioned, we have 25 plus teams, so we have data coming from various teams. And if you just to see the messaging product line, it is around 150K messages per second. And we have 30 plus Kafka brokers, and we have 210 plus Kafka topics, and our bulk load resources are around 150 plus. Since we have so much of data, our um, data in the data storage lake and, uh, is around petabyte scale. And we have around 350 plus cores of Spark. So this is the scale at which we handle the data. And we have so many varieties of sources and so many varieties of destination. Since we handle all these at this scale, and there is a strong governance model needed, and also strong compliance model needed. So that's when we put together the governance and compliance frameworks. So generally, when you are talking about governance and compliance, there are factors we need to consider. So what are the factors we need to consider if you are thinking about and if you are handling large amount of data? The first thing to do is collect what is needed. Start with small, right? 
and the second is metadata management. So it's not just about collecting just all the data, but also you need to know what you are collecting and how you can get value out of it. And the third is identify the kind of data and classify the data. Right? So for example, if it is a sensitive data, if it is a non-sensitive data, if it is a finance data, or so you need to classify the kinds of data. The fourth is data cleansing and data wrangling. So for example, there might be a data coming from multiple sources, so you may need to cleanse it or angle it, or there might be a duplication of the data, so you need to clean up the data. Apart from all this, also there is an easy onboarding. So the process of ingesting and onboarding the data into your various data sources should be easy and should be scalable. Collaboration and accessibility. Once the data is onboarded into your data storage, there has to be easy way to access it. And also there, if there is need a collaboration needed across the teams to um, consolidate the resources, there should be way. And the next is visualization of the data and data lineage. Yes, you should be able to track the ownership of the data. In addition to this, one other important factor you need to consider is the security. Right, so great power comes with great responsibility, yeah. Right, so we have a lot of data, so we should be responsible for making that data secure. Right, so need to make sure authentication, authorization, auditing, all those are enabled. And finally, data retention and cleanup. So to give some examples, so we have some of the compliance requirements, for example, SOX, GDPR, HIPAA, and PCI, right? So uh, we have worked on SOX, GDPR, and HIPAA is in progress. So as an example, we'll just quickly give an overview of GDPR. So GDPR, as we all know, it's originated in Europe. It is primarily around personal data. And based on the role of the um, resource, basically, whether it is a processor or controller, there are various obligation requirements. For example, there is a lawness, fairness, and transparency, purpose limitation, data minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, integrity, confidentiality, and accountability. So how do we um, take care of all these obligations? So we put together the measures, secure storage, anonymization, encryption, retention policies, auditing, deletion of data, and access control. As you can see, some of these measures overlap with the overall our governance factors. So with this, I'll hand over to Sunal. So he will dive into some of the layers we talked about, basically the ingestion and pipeline layer. Thanks, Sunil. OK. Hey. So hi, I'm Sunil Patil. I'm a software engineer in Twilio's data pipeline. And uh, she talked about various components of our pipeline, uh, things like Elasticsearch, uh, Kinesis, DynamoDB. But I'll mostly focus on our Kafka pipeline. So Kafka pipeline is our horizontal piece of infrastructure that different teams in Twilio use for different use cases. Uh, the simplest use case is, let's say team A wants to publish some data that team B wants to consume. But most common use case is when a team publishes some data, it goes through different layers and gets ingested into our Redshift-based warehouse. Uh, this is a high-level simplified version of how our Kafka pipeline works, uh, looks like. And I'll walk you through how the data flows through different components. And one important thing is, like, uh, we are platform team. So we do this thing for every new uh, topic or every, uh, and a team could have multiple topics. So we do this for uh, all of them, right? So when a team decides to onboard a topic on Kafka pipeline, the first thing that they do is they uh, create schema for their data and they publish it in the schema registry. Next, they create a Kafka topic and they start publishing messages which are compliant with their schema in the Kafka topic. Uh, then uh, we have this Kafka Connect application. What it does is it reads data from that Kafka topic and keeps writing it into this set of S3 buckets in intervals of five minutes. After that, we have this Spark application. So this Spark application is basically, we, we have a Spark batch processing framework 
and in that we create one job for every topic and we configure uh, like and most of the topics are or the jobs are supposed to run every one hour so whenever this park job for particular topic wakes up it will look at the data generated by kafka connect in this s3 bucket uh, and it will it knows like what all data it has already processed so far so it will only find out the data that it hasn't this park application hasn't processed so far it will also load the data that it has already processed and put in this s3 bucket it will take this both set of data combine it and then for every topic we have different set of deduplication rules so it will apply those deduplication rules and write the final copy of data in this set of s3 buckets once data is in s3 we have a warehouse loader application what it does is uh, like it is also uh, basically it also is scheduled to run on periodic basis and we have uh, different schedules for different topics so whenever warehouse loader application load uh, starts up it knows uh, like you know what are, what all data it has already processed so it finds out what all data was generated by spark uh, either as a new data or what all files were updated since it got chance to run last time it finds those deltas and then it will load, load it into the redshift table and for every topic we have a redshift uh, table so basically it will figure out optimized way of loading the new data uh, then teams use looker for generating reports on top of the redshift data so as you can imagine we had different teams reading and writing data into our pipeline and we needed a strong governance model to make sure that everybody agrees on what they, that data actually is going to look like Uh, for that we use a uh, schema registry now our schema registry is conceptually similar to kafka schema registry it's basically a rest service but this is in uh, in house implementation this is backed by dynamo db and it is uh, embedded in every aspect of our pipeline for example we have a jvm client or a jvm library that is integrated with schema registry and a team who wants to publish either produce or messages in kafka they can use that library to uh, either publish or consume messages same way if you have a non jvm client you can we have a http api so you can create a json message post it to this api that uh, api will check with the schema registry to make sure that your json message actually is compliant with the schema and post it in kafka topic same way uh, this schema is also used by our spark application so basically spark application will use this schema to figure out what should be the format of file that gets returned to s3 and that way uh, and that's a similar schema is used for redshift so basic idea here is a producer team can uh, control what should be the schema of their data in every single uh, component of our pipeline and they can do that by controlling the schema that they are posting uh, if you are not familiar with our avro schema definition file this is how a sample file looks like so i just created a very simplified version of how a sms message schema could look like so here you can see different fields so for every sms you need a, a string field to store the to and from phone number same way you need a message body field for storing the actual sms that is being sent and you might need additional fields for uh, things like account id like you know which customer uh, this message was sent for and date created and things like this now this is very simplified version but lot of our schemas tend to have embedded uh, objects inside them they tend to have list and map so basically uh, avro schema definition gives you sufficient tools to uh, model your complex business entities okay uh, so when J uh, gdpr came about we had to make sure that we are not storing any pii information and we solved that problem in a uh, two step approach first step was uh, we came up with this concept of twilio type so basically twilio type defines uh you know the set of business rules that you want to apply for data of particular type for example being twilio we deal with phone numbers a whole lot so for every phone number we decided that we'll take out last four digits of a phone number that way it becomes one of the 10000 possible combinations 
Same way, we came up with a business rule for commonly used entities such as email, device IPs, and other things. So if you look at this right hand side, this is the input message that we got for a SMS. And then this is the redacted version of it. So you can see like while redacting, uh, we X'd out last four digits for both to and from number. And for SMS, we, don't, we didn't have a good reason to hold on to somebody's actual SMS message. So we took out the content completely. So message body is completely empty. Uh, the next step was uh, to figure out uh, like, you know, the next step was to work with different teams to figure out what kind of PII information they are actually storing. So, uh, basically, when we worked with the SMS team, by looking at their schema, we figured out that they have a to field for storing phone number, from field for storing phone number, and we applied this Twilio type equal to phone number for both of them. Uh, same way, for removing the message body completely, we applied customer text to that. Right? And then uh, the next step was to actually do these redactions. And we had to do this in two different places. One, for, uh, one was for new or incoming data. And we built a Kafka Connect application for that. And other was for historical data. And we are using Spark for that. So this Kafka Connect application, what it does is it monitors the topic that it knows has PII data. And whenever a message appears in that topic, it will take that message, look at the schema registry to figure out what all redactions need to be applied, applies those re uh, redactions, and writes it into a new Kafka topic. Once the data is in Kafka topic, rest of our pi pipeline treats it as any other Kafka topic and takes it all the way to redacted version of that data in Redshift. The more interesting part was this Spark application. So basically, we build this Spark application, which is a, a, a job process or a batch processing application. And it is responsible for uh, handling or redacting historical data. So the way this application works is it takes the historical data and loads it into data frames. And then for that particular topic, it applies all the redactions. So as you can see, we have built UDS for each type of redaction. Uh, it applies the redaction and writes that into a different S3, bu S3 bucket. So a uh, couple of things, like you know, uh, we had huge amount of historical data. So we had to make sure that this process is able to scale. And due to simplicity of Spark, the way approach we uh, used is whenever we were uh, redacting a huge amount of historical data, we would load up a, or start a bigger Spark cluster. Uh, execute the job. Once the job is done, we could uh, shut it down. Other thing was like, you know, in addition to the Avro or Kafka based pipeline, due to historical nature, we had different other data formats like JSON, Avro. And these UDFs, they do have a lot of business logic and it's not easy to replicate. So what we did is uh, like we are using uh, data frames for every type of data. So even JSON, JSON data gets loaded into data frame and we can reuse the UDFs in that. Now, the last thing is, like, you know, uh, for most of the redaction, we made a conscious choice that we would take out sufficient information from the actual value so that even if we wanted, we cannot retrieve the original value back. So for phone number, we can't figure out what was the original number. But there are cases where you actually need ability to retrieve the original value back. In those cases, we are using encryption. So uh, basically, uh, to handle this, like Twilio uh, has built this centralized encryption service, which is a REST API, which takes two parameters. One is the account ID, and other is the value that needs encrypting. So when you call this service, it takes your account ID. Based on that, looks up uh, encryption key that is specific to that account and uses it to encrypt the value. In the data platform team, whenever we want to read a, encrypt a value, we uh, take that message, look up the account ID and value, pass it to the encryption service, get the encrypted value back, and store it as a part of our output. Uh, if a team wants access to, or if there is a genuine use case where they want access to the original data, they have to follow a separate process. With that, I'll hand it over to Shri for more details. Thanks, Sunil. So Sunil has explained about the pipeline uh, and the ingestion process. So we'll go to the, our next layer, which is basically a storage layer. So for today's discussion, we'll stick to uh, data lake. Um, primarily our data lake, we call it Tulio FS. 
One of the challenge with data lake is, yes, we ingest so much amount of data in various different formats and every team stores in different places. So how do we want to govern it, right? So we want a data lake and we don't want to turn that into a data swamp, right? So what are the measures or what are the things we can do so that it is in a standardized format and we can derive value out of it? So what is the solution we um, came up with is, the first one is, as earlier we mentioned, the metadata management. So we make sure that we take care of, for any data we are onboarding, we take care of the descriptive metadata, the structural metadata, and the administrative metadata. The next is the ingestion process. Already Sunil explained the ingestion process. We make sure that the data is ingested properly. Once it is ingested and it lands in the, uh, our data lake, we make sure that the data is organized properly. For example, the directories, subdirectories, how we are tagging, and then there is a cleansing. If there is a cleansing needs to happen, the cleansing. And it is also important to make sure you index the data appropriately, right? Uh, if there is a versioning or encryption needed, it is better to do the versioning and encryption according to your requirement. Yes, we ingested the data, we stored the data according to our governance requirements, and next is how you access the data. So we provide a library for all our internal teams to access the data. So they don't need to worry about what are the complexities behind our data lake, they just need to access the APIs. And internally, we take care of managing that. And also to access the data, so there are some rules around who can see what data and et cetera. So this is a simplified version of our uh, data lake. So as you can see, so we have, for example, Kafka live stream, or Kafka historical, or um, Kinesis live stream, or Kinesis historical, or our bulk load live stream, or bulk load historical. So we have all these sources. So the, some of the main things we have to take care of is the first step is cleansing the data or deduping the data. So we have the next layer is Spark. The Spark takes the data and dedupes the data based on the configuration we provide. The second thing is, as we have so many data sources, and some cases actually, the data flows through multiple data sources. For example, voice, some set of voice calls flows through one um, flow, whereas other set of voice calls flows through other channel. So in that case, we still need to transform it and merge it or come to a common format. So in that case, the Sparks take care of wrangling as well and make sure it is in a canonical format so that the downstream team, they don't need to worry about what kind of voice calls or what kind of details. So as you see, so once you from the various different sources, after the Spark consolidates the data, we have cleansed raw data, cleansed redacted data, and cleansed encryption data. So why three versions, right? Or why different kinds of treatments for different kinds of data, right? So we, uh, earlier we have seen, we need to understand the data and also the sensitivity of the data. So if the data doesn't have any personal or PHI or any critical information, it can stay as raw. If the data has some information, personal information, and if we don't want it, so we go through the redaction channel, we configure it for redaction, so automatically it will get redacted and it will get consolidated. For example, some information critical, but still we needed it for customers to support our customers, then we go for encryption. So we have actually the Spark jobs which can take care of based on our configuration, which can take care of, okay, based on the type of data, it can take appropriate action. Once we have the consolidated data, and then there is a next set of Spark jobs that's based on the individual teams or use cases. Basically, they aggregate the uh, resources. So if you have, for example, one resource which is calls or another resource messages, if they have to aggregate based on all of that, the job, the Spark job will aggregate the cleanse, it work on the cleanse to data and aggregates the message. And further downstream, we have various analytics or data science use cases or some teams directly, for example, wireless, they directly take it from the data lake. So as we discussed, so here are the challenges when we process the data. So one is our data lake scale is in petabytes and we have various requirements across different teams. And sometimes we need to migrate the data from one system to another system. 
So having that huge amount of data and migrating to another system is not that easy, right? So, and also if you have to stand up a totally new system from all the historical data, for example, that is also not easy, right? So what are the solutions? The first one, as I described, it's a dynamic transformers. The second one is transforming the data formats. Third one is compliance. In addition to that, we have transformation library and primarily we use Parquet format for crunching. All of these are powered by Spark. So we use Spark SQL extensively, Spark data frames, RDDs, Spark streaming, and Spark Emlet. This is an example of our dynamic transformers. So you can see here, just for example, we simplified the way, this is a simplified version. So as you can see, there are three fields, and if you want to dedupe, it's just a configuration, automatically it gets deduped and merged based on, for example, if the field is message ID, it gets deduped based on message ID. And if, the, if you want to merge based on data updated, it can merge based on data updated. And if you want to index, and again, it's just a configuration, but the downstream a dynamic uh, Spark application can take care of all of this just with one single configuration. Okay, so last not, but not least, the important thing is data deletion and retention. So it's not about just collecting the data and then getting value out of it, but once probably you have used the data, it is no longer, you need to retain, so you need to clean up the data as well. So from compliance requirements perspective, we need to delete our sometimes customer's data and also delete their customer data. And for some legal reasons, sometimes we need to hold on to some legal data. And also the customer can initiate any deletions as well. So what are the challenges when we have to do deletion on this large set of data? So it's basically, for example, the data can range from last 10 years. And what are the indexing and deletion strategy? So what is our solution for that? So primarily, again, we used a Spark for deleting and migrating the data in bulk for a few reasons. One is distributed, the second is it's simple, and also it's scalable as we have so much of data. So it's not just about just using the Spark, you need to make sure you load test it and, ex and you tune your executors. So for example, this is a simple snippet where you can see we filter out the specific accounts and then we can delete it. So this is our uh, deletion framework. So in this one, it's just again 10,000 foot view. So we are uh, just uh, showcasing just three use cases. So for example, when a customer closes the account or when a customer initiates, they want to delete their message or there is a periodic retention period associated with specific product. So in this case, you can see here, customer initiates a delete. It, came, it comes through our REST API. It comes to our Kafka topic and we delete from transactional database. But when we want to delete from the S3, it's not that easy. So we have to use our Spark application to delete the data. When a customer cl uh, closes their account, the account close event will come through our Kafka. So here the REST API reads the uh, information and also it checks with our retention configuration. So we maintain the retention configuration in the Zookeeper across our products and also based on general account level uh, deletion configuration as well. So it validates, okay, whether it is ready for complete deletion or is there any other thing we need to do. So once the validation is successful, it gives the handoff to um, Spark job. The Spark job, again, takes care of cleaning the data, which is basically, for example, if it's 10 years worth of data, it has to clean all the 10 years worth of data. The third one is the retention based on uh, product level retention. So for example, you can say, yes, I must, we want to delete every 30 days. So in that case, we have to go and delete the SMS every 30 days from the lake. So um, as we have seen, it is not a, a simple and easy to handle that large amount of data, uh, especially deletion, um, as it is not a transactional store. So we had to do a lot of uh, performance testing and um, do a lot of testing on various strategies. So we primarily analyze three strategy, which is account-based, group-based, and day-based. So these are some of the results, account-based. It didn't scale well, group-based. It didn't, uh, it's better, performance is better, but again, it didn't scale well. 
And finally, we went with our day-based approach. So what are the learnings actually? So make sure your data lake is indexed and partitioned appropriately. And also keep an eye on how many files it is getting generated and how many indexes are getting generated. And that can kill your performance as well. On top of that, you need to have a, a, a way or process to track your job. So we built a, a tracking layer on top of the Zookeeper to make sure, okay, where are we? There is a delete uh, account closure activity happened, but where are we in the deletion process? Okay, so what's next? Um, so primarily we have um, one of the governance completely to close that. So we also want to do self-service at all layers. So any team they want to do, they can use the self-service tools to take care of everything. So they don't need to rely on the data platform team as such for completely everything. Uh, these are some of our related links and we are hiring. So. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, we, have, we don't really have time for questions, but the speakers will be down here so you guys can approach them individually. Thank you guys, next session in 10 minutes. <laughs>